The name of this song is There is a River. You might know the story of the Samaritan woman who Jesus met at the well. And he didn't say, clean your life up, and then I'll give you this living water. He gave her the living water and then told her that she could clean her life up. In order to clean our lives up, it happened with me. I had to have the living water first. Amen. Amen.
Yeah, yeah. buddy, you can have them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Very good. Man, that song's been around a little while. Give you a little history on that song. Way back in a million years ago, I married a woman, and uh, she was working for the federal government. She, and this will give you the dating on it. it was, she worked for Health, Education, and Welfare. Y'all ever heard of them? Health, Education, and Welfare. She was working with them, and she was an accountant. And uh, <clears throat> We hadn't been married, I, I think we'd been married about a year. I'd been saved about a year and a half, maybe. Because she wouldn't have had nothing to do with me before I got saved. But Anyhow, that song, I was working, she was trying to get another degree, too. I can't remember all the story just right. I think the way she was working for health, education, welfare, trying to get another degree, you know, because she thought education was important. Back in them days, I didn't care much about it. I was working so she could go to school. I was working at night in a pipe foundry. Y'all ever worked in a pipe foundry? Yeah. You never did do that, John? No. <laughs> it's real loud. But on the way to work every night, Brother Toll's music show would come on. Y'all ever heard of Brother Toll, anybody? It'd be on. And that was a theme song. There is a river. They'd play that, and I'd be praising the Lord because I, you know, I'd been saved. Glad to be saved. Glad to be married to a woman at work. <laughs> no, praise the Lord. No, and it was glorious. And, I, and, and God was dealing with me because I was, I was working so she could go to school and everything. And I was coon hunting all the time I could, you know, back then. And, and I had a dog that had just died. And he was a real good dog. And I was in mourning over that. And, but I'd be driving up through there and that song would come on. It would come on every night at 10 o'clock Central Time because we were living in the great state of Alabama at that time. And, and, and that song would be on there, and I'd go to pray and talk to the Lord, and he was talking to me. You know, I think, there is a river, praise the Lord. He kept talking to me and talking to me about he wanted me to be a preacher, and I didn't want to be a preacher much. I didn't know much about that. I loved my preacher, Dog Ear Crop. I loved him. But I didn't want to do that because that's heartache and misery, I thought. You know, I'd rather work in a pipe shop and hunt coons and let Karen work for the government. It's a good life. But God was dealing with me. So finally one day I come home and, you know, I worked at night. And I come home in the next afternoon. I'm just going to tell you a story because it's just an amazing, great story. And I love that song. So you just going to have to bear with me and shut up. Now look, now here's the deal. You know, and I love that song. And I get to praise the Lord. And I stopped that old uh, Chevrolet truck on the side of the road one night. And I said, God, if you really do want me to preach, if that's really what you want me to do, then I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll tell my wife tomorrow. And so I go back home, feed the dogs and everything, go to bed, get up and eat me a good spam sandwich. I'm sure that's what I ate because that's good Christian food. <laughs> and I got up and I was praising the Lord. And she got off from health, education, welfare at 5 o'clock every day because the government will let you off on time, brother. <laughs> Amen. Because they don't want to pay overtime. Not to accountants. And so she comes home and I'm waiting on her. And she comes in and... And she could see I wanted to talk to her about something. I was trying to help about getting a meal together, and I didn't know how to do that. You know, and I said, Karen, I want to tell you something. You know, when I, and I told her about the song. There's a, you know, and I said, I listen to that every night, and God's been talking to me. I said, I tell you what, I think God's calling me to preach. And I was real emotional, because sometimes I get emotional. Well, she's not as emotional as me. And she just looked at me, and she said, well, you're going to have to go to school because you don't know anything. <laughs> that was the whole statement. That's it. You know, I just, you know, just buried my dog. <laughs> Not long before. He's a real good one, too. I'm telling you now. He's great. And, and you know, and I'm sharing this with her, and, but accountants do you that way. Any of you accountants, yeah, I know some of you. They just, that's it, right across the line. Well, you don't know anything. I said, well, and she said, but you leave that to me. If you really believe God's calling you to preach, I'll get you in a school. I said, Karen Lynn, uh, listen, there's no school in America going to take me. You know, I didn't halfway go to high school. You know, I just went and took tests. I, I skipped every day I could, Mary. If I could find a reason to skip, I would. And if I couldn't find a reason to skip, I would. 
And the truth is, the administration was glad it did. They graduated me, and when I graduated from high school, Dr. Mann said, Scott, I'm so glad to get you out of my school. You know I'm just sending you on. I said, thank you. I hated school. And she, you know what she did, and some of y'all relate to this because you're a Southern Baptist. She's a blue blood Southern Baptist, and I didn't even know what that was until I married her. She went to the associational missionary, and she told him my story. And you know what they did? They got me together, enrolled in Clear Creek Baptist Bible College on probation. <laughs> and the rest of the story is history. All right? But that's how it happened, and that's why I love that song, because I'd listen to it going up, going to the pipe shop to work, you know, at, at nighttime. There is a river, old Brother Tall, and his music show. Do y'all, and none of you ever heard of Brother Tall? It must be. Although it was out of Ohio, Cincinnati, Ohio. <laughs> Praise God. I want you to take your Bible, and I love that song, and that, you know, I knew y'all were saying it because I saw it on my, on, on my email that y'all were doing that. And I said, man, that's, you can't contain yourself on that song. Praise the Lord, Mary. That's a good song, all right? And listen, when you go to Florida this week, you pay attention about my youngin'. You will, all right? And if you need to beat her, you just go to it, sister. <laughs> no, you won't have to. She's a good youngin'. Yeah, Amen. I want you to take your Bible. I want to talk to you about total obedience really quickly here today. And we've worshiped the Lord. Have you already worshiped the Lord? Yeah. All right, I'll just ask this thing and we'll give invitation to somebody to get right with God today. It'd be a good thing. You know it. Yeah. Well, it's like Bo was saying this morning. Man, old Bo preached the gospel this morning. And I think he knows the book of Romans by heart because he was quoting it and didn't even know it. One verse after another. Boom, 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 <laughs> boom. And I get tickled to death sometimes in Sunday school class. But he's... But Bo was trying to explain why people would sit home on Sunday morning and just sit there and want to watch Dumb and Dumber <laughs> on TV rather than come to church. You know what he said? His analysis was this. It's just cause the meanness in you. <laughs> and you know what? Listen to me. And he is right because the fifth chapter of Romans explains everything he just said. We were born depraved. We did not know God. We were born sinners, natural sinners. And he went on to talk about that too as we, oh, and all of you were in Romans today. But listen, God calls on us to be totally obedient to him. Look, I want you to take your Bible and turn quickly to Joshua 15, verse 63. Let me pray with you. Lord, we do ask you to continue now. And we praise your holy name that there is a river. The Bible says it very plainly in the book of the Revelation. You inspired John to write that, and that gives us eternal hope and glory because we know there is, and we know we'll see it. And Lord, it is our prayer that every person in this place sees that same river and sings that song. I don't know if that's the song we're going to sing, but I think we'll remember it. Praise your holy name. Speak to us from your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Two weeks ago, I shared with you a story about Joshua. And listen, was, was not, was not, was not Alice Lloyd good last week? Yes, amen. amen. And you know what they did? And they did this, and I've had a lot of groups come in my lifetime. They sent us, they sent us a thank you. Some of you read it. And that, praise the Lord if that told them we said thank you. Amen. But look, two weeks ago, I shared with you that Joshua... Uh, had encountered, literally encountered, the pre-incarnate Christ. This is in the fifth chapter of Joshua. And once Joshua saw the Lord, what did he do? He fell down and worshiped God. And folks, listen, when you get to that river, that's, you're going to do that. You know, a lot of times people will give testimonies. They say, when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask so-and-so why he did so-and-so. And I'm going to ask John Brown why he did this. No, you're not. When you get to heaven, you're going to fall on your knees and sing glory. That's what you'll do because you shall see the king. I don't even know if I can preach today. I'm, I, you know, it's, this is, boy, wow. Okay, listen, listen, listen. And Joshua saw the reality that before God, he must give God total surrender. You remember that? Total surrender. 
Now, I went on to tell you that God really does, He really does expect complete total surrender from every one of us. That's in the Scripture. Listen, Deuteronomy uh, 6, 5 tells us this. It makes it very plain. Here's what it says. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Okay? Did you hear that? That means that everything about us, everything about us, everything we are, everything we own, everything is to be totally surrendered unto God. That's literally what it means, and nothing else is acceptable. That comes right out of the Old Testament. Now, in the New Testament, in the writings of Luke, Dr. Luke, you remember him? He was the doctor. He was a a, a Gentile doctor who got saved under the preaching of Paul. He wrote the Gospel of Luke. Listen, this is what he wrote there in Luke 9, 23. He was quoting Jesus. Jesus said to them, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Now, I quoted that to you for three weeks in a row. Now, listen to this. If you take from the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 5, 6, and from the New Testament, Luke 9, 23, and put it together you'll have this proposition, okay? There's a proposal there to the children of God. Here it is. If we give the Lord God our love with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our might, then we will die to ourselves. We will take up the cross and we will follow Him, okay? That's that's reality. In other words, if I'm in total surrender to Jesus, my life is going to give evidence to that fact. Because why? Because I am seeking to live in total obedience to Him. Okay? That's just reality. Now, we know that can be done. We know it can be done because in the Old Testament we find the stories of who? We've been talking about it for a few months. Joshua and Caleb. They surrendered their lives unto God totally. From the get to the go, they were surrendered unto God and they obeyed God. Now, we know that Joshua and we know that Caleb lived in obedience to the Lord, total obedience to the Lord. All right? Now, how do you do that? Well, quickly in a nutshell, Bo told us this morning, when somebody asked him about that, he said, well, I pray a lot. And there it is. There is the answer. Okay? All right, but now I want you to listen to this a little bit more. You know, because I'm the preacher, Bo's not, and you can't go home on that. All right? Listen, listen here. But that was a good sermon. I pray a lot. That's how you totally surrender, buddy. That's, That's pretty good. That's pretty good. Listen, however... Even though Joshua and Caleb lived in total surrender and total obedience to the Lord, a lot of people, a lot of the children of God, they did not when they went in the promised land. They went in the promised land. They had the blessings that Caleb and Joshua had. They reaped that harvest, but they didn't reap it the same way that Joshua did. They did not reap it the same way that Caleb did because they were not in total obedience to Unto God. They didn't do that. Now I want us to look at this uh, verse, this text, and and talk about our need really quickly uh, to be in total obedience to our king. Listen listen to this. In uh, chapter 15 and and the 63rd verse, the very last verse in chapter 15 of Joshua, we find this. Now as for the Jebusites, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the sons of Judah could not drive them out. So the Jebusites live with the sons of Judah at Jerusalem unto this day. And unto this day meant the day of the writing of the book of Joshua. Now here's the deal. If you read the book of Joshua and all those chapters that you get bored because it says, and it is kind of boring because it's, you know, it's, it's where in now this, this tribe gets this much land and this tribe gets this much land and Judah gets this and Naphtali gets this, and you're reading through all of that. And God was doing what? God had told them from the beginning, every foot of ground that you step on in the promised land, I'll give it to you. He said that several times, okay? 
And I'm paraphrasing that, but you can read the book. And I don't have time to read you the whole uh, first five books of the Bible today, but it's there. He said, every place you go, I'll give it to you. I promise you, I will drive the enemies out of the land. And so every place wherein the Hebrews went, wherein they were faithful to God because God had given them that covenant. He'd made a covenant with them. God drove the inhabitants out. All right? He did it. But there came a time when some of these folks, when God gave them the land and he had said, look, I'll defeat the enemies. I'll give you the land. They just did not stick with God. They just did not obey God. They just did not keep on doing what they were supposed to be doing. Maybe they got tired. Maybe they wanted to do like Bo said, and they just wanted to watch Dumb and Dumber and not do what they should do. But I want to tell you this. They were not all obedient, and that's why that God's Word said they wound up living with the Jebusites. Now, the Jebusites were one of the tribes of the Canaanites. Now, when you read the whole Old Testament, who did the Hebrews have constant trouble with all the way through? The Canaanites. Who led them into idol worship? The Canaanites. Who did those young men marry and got them in all that trouble? That bunch of Canaanites. Back when I was in school and I was having to memorize all this stuff and what tribe was here in the eastern part and that part, I'd make up songs about it because I could make up a song. All right? So I could remember this stuff because I wanted to make A's on my test. That is normal, right? To want to make an A on a test. I mean, children, why do you go to school and not work real hard to make A's on all your tests? Now, if you go to church here, I want you to work real hard to make A's on your test. I don't want you to say, well, I'll take a D. No, that's what I did. And they had to put me in college on probation. You don't want that. All right, listen, listen, listen. And I, I would make up songs about these tribes, and I would say, multi headed Canaanites, all they wanted to do is fight, and I had them. <laughs> and to this day, I remember the Canaanites and all the bad junk they did. They led Israel into apostasy. Why? Because the Israelites did not drive them out of the land like God told them to, and God would have done it if they would have just stepped up and said, here I am, Lord, move them. Now, what did Caleb do? Caleb did exactly that, right? Now, we know we saw all the time, what? The strong faith of Caleb. We saw the strong faith of Joshua. They trusted God. They trusted him. They were obedient to him. The scripture says that over and over. Now, but at the same time, we saw people with weak obedience, with half-hearted obedience. Here's the deal. Caleb and Joshua understood something, obviously, that these other people didn't really understand. The God who defeated the armies of Jericho and the God who defeated the giants at Hebron for Caleb is the same God that would have defeated the Jebusites at Jerusalem if the people had obeyed him. And now, why do we say that? Because children, listen, God is always faithful to his covenant with us. All the way through the Old Testament, he was always faithful. As a matter of fact, God made good on everything that he promised. Over, uh, continuing in the book of Joshua, <clears throat> excuse me, in the 21st chapter, the 45th verse says, <clears throat> excuse me, none of the good promises the Lord made to the house of Israel failed. Everything was fulfilled. And then we might think, well, wait a minute now, wait a minute now. They, did, they didn't run all the people out of there. Whose fault was that? It was theirs because everything that God said he would do, he did. Do you know sometimes why we have defeats in our lives? It's because we're not giving over to God in total obedience. Sometimes we're living like rascals and then we run into a problem. We say, now God, get me out of this mess, you know. Because so-and-so did this and so-and-so did that and here I am in trouble. I want to tell you something. A lot of times if we would be obedient to God, we wouldn't be in that mess in the first place. But I tell you this, we're going to get in messes anyway because that's life, right? But if we're trusting God, we can trust Him to get us through there. Listen, listen, listen. God keeps His covenant. He kept it with Israel. And what kind of covenant do we have, friend? We have a covenant that was by blood, the blood of Christ. 
You and I as born again believers today, we are in blood covenant with holy God and the blood of covenant that we have is not, and I'm quoting Hebrews here, it is not the blood of bulls and goats and sheep. It is the blood of God's one son. It is the blood of the son. By his blood we are redeemed. There is no remission of sin without the shedding of blood. What blood? Jesus' blood. We're in a blood covenant with holy God. And if we're in a blood covenant with holy God and that blood is the blood of Jesus, certainly we can expect God to keep that covenant. God will take care of us. And God has said, I will take care of you. And that, but he has given us some strong warnings about not trusting him. Listen, once we're in covenant with God, God fully expects us to obey, to obey him. He expects that. Now, why does he expect that? Because he provides the ability to obey him. And again, that comes right back there like the man said, I pray a lot. That's what the fellow said. See, if we catch that, how do we activate the power of God in our life? And I'm, that's not Pentecostal. That's just biblical, okay? But it ain't going to hurt some of you to get a little Pentecostal every now and then. I need to send y'all in truckloads down to drift for a music time and bring you back <laughs> every now and again. Okay, listen, 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 listen. We learn to obey God when we talk to God. How did you learn to obey your mama? By talking to your mama. How, how did you learn to obey your daddy? By talking to your daddy and you communicated with him and he told you what he expected and you did it because you knew that you were in covenant with him because you were his kid. Look, listen, listen, listen. By the blood of Christ, we are the kids of God. Now that might sound southern folks, but I want you to understand we are the children of God by the blood of Christ and we're in covenant with him and he's going to take care of us. And he has strongly warned us not to neglect that. Listen to this. 1 John 2, 4 and 5. He who says, I know him, talking about Jesus, and does not keep his commandments, does not obey him. Listen, this is strong. He is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected to him. By this we know that we are in him. How do we know that we are in right relationship with God? Because we want to obey him. And we are going to seek to obey him. Does that mean you're going to live perfect and never fail? Of course not. Does God know that? Of course God knows that. Did Caleb ever mess up? Of course he did. Did Joshua ever mess up? Of course he did. But what did they do? They got it right with God. You read at least three times in the book of Joshua where Joshua was going on there on his own way and then God reminded him, I'm God, you're not. And Joshua fell down before God and got it right. He didn't continue in rebellion. But just as there is a strong uh, uh, warning here, Jesus always gives a strong promise. Have you ever noticed that? When they were singing that song about the lady at the well and she knew she was on her way to hell, that's a strong warning. But there is a river, right, that flows from the throne of God. Amen. You need to eat this today. You need to eat it. Listen, here's a strong promise. Just as certainly as there's a strong warning, there's always a strong promise from God. Listen, Mark 10, 29 through 30. Jesus said... Truly I say to you, now listen to this, there is no one. Now how many does that mean? None. Everybody. Right? There is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mothers or fathers or children or farms for my sake and for the gospel's sake but that he will receive a hundred times as much now in the present age, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and farms, along with persecutions. That's coming, right? And in the age to come, watch, watch, what? Eternal life. That's the strong promise. Now what's that saying? And, the, and, and that don't mean for you to run off and leave your mama. That don't mean for you to run off and leave your kids. That's not what he's saying. That's using hyperbole to make the point. I learned that in school. Yeah, that's right. Amen, sister. I've been reading about you. I figure your head will swell up big as a melon here for long. Yeah, you're a big deal now. Yeah. 
But I want to tell you something. With the coming of the big deal comes hard life. Woo! You got responsibilities. And I want to tell you, listen, listen, I, I love her, see, and, and I got to fudge there a little bit because I want to take care of my kids this week. <laughs> listen, listen, listen. Listen. That's not telling you to walk away from your responsibilities in life. That's telling you, using the extreme illustration, that no matter what you do in this life, no matter what you have to give up, no matter what you have to deal with, no matter what you have to go through, if you trust God, if you obey God, if you keep his commandments, he's going to take care of you, not just in this life, but in the life to come. And hey, a lot of times, the longer we live, the more we need to be looking at that life to come. Because I'm going to tell you, the older you get, the more you realize a lot of this stuff down here don't mean a whole lot. All right? It don't mean a whole lot, does it? Okay? When I was younger, there were certain things I had to have. I'm going to have that or die. It's going to be mine. I'm going to have that car or I'm going to die if I don't get it. I'm going to have that shotgun. I'm going to have that dog. Now, remember, I told you dog died. But look. All those things get old. All those things wear out. All those achievements will come to a halt. But I want to tell you something. Obeying God means that no matter what you go through, He's going to take care of you. It doesn't matter. And He told us that. You're going to have persecutions. What does that mean? You're going to have sorrows. You're going to have tribulations. You're going to be sick. Yes, you are. This flu coming through here, you think, why in the world I got this mess? Because this is this life, buddy. You know, I started coughing again two days ago. You're next. Man. And I thought, not again. I don't want this mess no more. I haven't had this stuff twice. I'm about ready to lock all my kids away until they get out of school. That's got to be where it's coming from. Yeah. Can't be in the water, can he? <laughs> now listen to me quickly. Listen, children. No matter what, God will get you through it. And I don't say that as some jack leg that had never been anywhere. Had never done anything. I've been up, down, all around. And I've seen the rodeo. And folks, listen. I've seen the elephant. Some of you know what that means. I've seen that right there. I have seen the elephant. seen him. He's real. But I want to tell you something. There are no elephants. There are no giants. There are no little mean men. There's no dumb and dumbers. There's no this or that or the other big enough to keep you from holy God. You studied this in Sunday school this morning if you were in any adult class. There is no power on earth that can separate you from the love of Jesus, Right? Right? And he goes on to say, and I'm going to take care of you in eternity. So what's he asking us to do? Obey him. Obey him. Total surrender means this. John, get ready, we're going to do an invitation. Total surrender means this. If you recognize that you are a sinner before a just and a righteous God, and you say, God, I've sinned against you, please forgive me. I receive Jesus as my Savior. I want him to save you. You're totally surrendering your life. And once you do that, we need to live in obedience to him. Not so we can keep ourselves saved. No, 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 brothers and sisters. Because there's no power that can separate you from a saving God. Okay? But you want to obey God with all of your life that he might be able to use you in this life and that he may be glorified with your life. Okay? And that you might grow more and more and more in the image of Christ. And the more we grow in the image of Christ, the more we realize a lot of stuff down here don't matter. It just don't matter. It just don't matter. And it don't, does it? It don't matter, brother. Robert, it don't matter. In the end, it don't matter. Because one of these days, I'm going to see that jury. And that's not pie in the sky silliness. You know, 
I know we live in a society that says, you Christians are all crazy. Well, maybe we are. But I tell you this, we are not without reward. We have the future. It belongs to us because it's in the hands of God. What am I trying to tell you? No matter what you go through in this life, God will get you through it. Now, you may be scarred, busted, and broke down, all right? And some of you are sitting here today, you don't know what in the world is going to happen. Some of you are facing giants that you say, boy, that's a giant. And I mean, it's a big one. And I want to tell you something. Giants are rough. And you're not, you're not facing little Casper the ghost here. It's real, right? You're going through things that are rough and hard and you don't know. But you need to do what the brother said. You just need to start talking to God. Because I, I put something on the internet. I, I was sitting around thinking about this and thinking about giants in my own life and mess I'm trying to deal with. And try, you know, every day it's the same junk sometimes. You know what I mean? I mean, every day you get up and put your pants on, comb your hair, and face that same giant, don't you? Right? But you face that giant even if you don't comb your hair. Every now and then you might not even feel like doing that. Me and Butch comb our hair because me and Butch is vain. <laughs> no, you're not. Listen, listen. And you're facing stuff. I said, wait a minute. I don't need to pray to remind God I got this going on. I need to pray to remind me and to inform what's going on in my life that there's a God in heaven and he can handle my problems. See, God knows about your problems. Sometimes we just need to go on and take those problems to God and say, here they are. I can't do this. And most of the stuff we can't fix, right? You know that. Now we try to, especially men. We try to fix everything, right? You ever, you ever have your wife, she wants to talk to you about something, all she wants you to do is listen. You think it's funny. You ain't even old enough to laugh at that. <laughs> but they just want you to listen sometimes. You ever get in there and you, you, you start listening, the next thing you know, well, I can fix that. That ain't no problem. That ain't no big deal, woman. I'll take care of that real quick. I'll go down there and fix it right now. And you know what then they do? You ever had this happen to you, fellas? Then they go to Bali. You say, what in the world is wrong? I told you I'd fix that. I can fix it. I didn't ask you to fix it. I just want you to listen to me. You ever have that? I know you can't confess that. Your wife will kill you. <laughs> listen. Listen to me. Listen. You can't fix it. You have to. There's things we can't fix. But God can. We need to trust him. Now, he might not fix it exactly like I want him to, but he always fixes it better than I want him to. You know, sometimes God kills giants differently than we do. Right? And sometimes God lets a giant hang around for a while. You know why? You know what he's doing? You know what he's doing? Sometimes when God lets an old giant hang around in your life a little bit, it's because he's making you bigger than the giant. He's growing you. He's using the hardship that, that giant's putting in your life to feed your soul to make you larger than the giants of this world. And those little giants, they disappear, and one of these days, God's going to bring you into his glory. Jesus is going to present you unto himself. And that's an amazing verse. And you will be without spot or blemish. Well, you know, like one old preacher said, God will iron you down. You won't have a wrinkle when you get to heaven. You'll be shining bright, starched, pure. I think the guy worked in the laundry. I don't know. <laughs> Listen. But he's right about it. God's going to present us to himself. And he's going to say, this is my accomplishment. And then he's going to say what you want to hear. Come on in. Now, friend, surrender your life to Jesus today and obey him. And he'll walk you through this. Because you can't handle it on your own. Father, have your way in our lives. And we thank you that you give us stories like Caleb and Joshua. But we thank you also that you tell us about those that didn't obey and how that they just are forgotten today. Unless you read and read and read. 
Lord, we ask you to help us to obey you and to trust you no matter what. And Father, we know the devil hates us and he's going to bring things against us and just as sure as we get out of here, he will. But Lord, we know that you're an overcoming God. We know that you're an all-consuming God. We know that you are our loving God and you're going to take care of us. So Lord, I just ask you to help us to surrender all to you and to walk in faith, trusting you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now if you're here and you don't know the Lord, you